Okay. okay. Uh, hello, we are the Idle Spaces Working Group and we want to present uh, the topic of utopia and decentralization. My name is Ulrich Gehmann and together with Emilke Bader, also a member of our working group, we want to go into this topic. Uh, it uh, might be look a bit unusual to speak about this uh, general this general topic of utopia, but I think uh, related to decentralization, it is very important to to go back to basics a little bit. No? Uh, in our contribution, we will concentrate on positive utopias, so-called oi utopias or good utopias, and not on dystopian scenarios, no matter their kind. At first glance, the title Utopia and Decentralization seems to be an overt contradiction because formal traditional concepts of utopias are the very opposite to decentralization. Why? Utopia is about social organization in the end. Its aim is to create the best social organization possible. This act of creation demands an encompassing, means central plan for all relevant social activities, for work, leisure time, education, gender roles, and so on. There is no place, in other words, for decentralized, non-planned domains or activities inside the utopian society longed for. Out of these reasons, such a classical form of utopia has been called archistic or rule and power oriented utopia from the Greek word of archein, which means to rule. This is the predominant type of utopia. Related, the utopian order is the final order, the end of history, essentially. The best organization needs not to be ameliorated anymore. Otherwise, it won't be the best. And the humans living inside such utopian conditions have no desire to change them, at least according to their planners. If history equals the emergence of the unforeseen, the new, then utopia eo ipso equals the end of history. In line with its Christian heritage, utopia is about redemption, a redeeming humankind does not need to be redeemed any further. Decentralization, on the other hand, can stand as an epitome for that very history that has been surrendered by the utopian state. History is contingent, unforeseen, and unknown, and hence unsecure future. What about the other type of utopia, the so-called anarchistic that is non-rule-based utopia. Here, decentralization comes into play, not as an epitome for history, but as a one for being finally liberated and hence free on an individual level. According to this conception, a liberated society, in its final outcome, a redeemed humankind again, does not need rules. On the contrary, the cage of rules is deadly for the individual unfolding and the latter is seen as the prime force for becoming free and hence redeemed. Which is the final utopian aim also for an anarchistic utopia, redemption. We re realize again the influence of a Christian heritage here yeah, in both cases of utopia. Therefore, the relation of anarchistic utopias to history is the same as in the first type, the archistic one. A redeemed mankind is no longer the subject of history as we know it. Also here, as in the first utopian type, the history to come after the utopian state has been reached is an eternal more of the same namely the ongoing of a redeemed humankind in a second and final paradise. An additional perspective shines up. Utopias are intrinsically linked to assumptions about a human condition, or in classical terms of an Occidental understanding of our cultural sphere, of a conditio humana. What is the nature, the very essence of human beings that they they are in need of becoming liberated, even redeemed. Why is this so important? 
In both versions of Utopia, the artistic and the anarchistic one, the rule-based and the decentralized version, humans cannot stay as they are. They have to be ameliorated to achieve a true, means positive, conditio humana. Again, the aim is the same, only the ways to reach it differ. To be achieved by central planning, formatting and management, this is the issue of the artistic version, or by the free play of forces realized in the anarchistic utopia as an epitome of complete and consequent decentralization. For concluding this part, we have two major realized utopias in the 20th century. The capitalist version uh, for the anarchistic utopia and the socialist version for the artistic utopia. And both versions failed, clear. No? And interesting is to see why they failed and why they came out as the very opposite to any kind of liberation. Okay, thank you. So it's my turn now. Hi, everybody. My name is also Enrique. Um, so my part is a little bit trying to focus and to also reflect on these ideas as they are working today. So I'm going to start with a quote from Blaise Pascal. Uh, all, in, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. So this quote is surprisingly biting in the current context of COVID-19. Technology and travel such movement has become essential, if not a necessary part of most people's life. Movement, technology and humans, they don't exist on their own in a vacuum. They connect to each other and interlink with each other in various ways, and they're often regulated by, system, in, by systems. This links back to the artistic OTP, which is very much centralized and following specific rules. So the decision to go somewhere while that belongs to the individual, the means or the system of doing so in some form or another is predetermined. Public transportation is a prime example, for example, but even when you decide to drive a car by yourself, the road and the highway system determines where and how one can go. Quoting Baumann, modernity starts when space and time are separated from living practice and from each other, and so become ready to be theorized as distinct and mutually independent categories of strategy and action. Due to technical development, the speed with which power moves has changed, and that has changed modernity. Bauman uses the metaphor of liquidity to describe the current contemporary condition of light capitalism, where contemporary <laughs> power is nested in the movement of knowledge, people, and capital. His term, liquid modernity, is no longer constrained by industry bureaucracy and the panopticon. It allows capital to travel light at electronic speed and domination consists in one's own capacity to escape, disengage, to be elsewhere and the right to decide the speed at which all this is done. Modern and urban life is dense and in constant movement. The air of a city makes one free, but the freedom it offers comes with its own shackles. The individual must confirm and fit the limitations of living with many. Inhabitants mold cities, and the city, in turn, molds them so that they can fit together in this complex system. Now we can come back to a general perspective again. In the face of such developments shaping our everyday lives, what then about decentralized anarchistic utopias? It might not be evident at first glance, but today, as already indicated, we have a version of such a utopia, a concrete utopie, in the words of uh, German researchers of, on utopia, Ernst Bloch or Karl Mannheim. A concrete, realized utopia is the concrete utopie. It is the recent global neoliberal capitalism, a non-place, an utopos. This is the original Greek meaning of an utopia, a non-place in several directions. It refrains from centralized control mechanisms impeding its operations. It emphasizes the unfolding of the force of the individual, the free play of forces inside the terms of a second neo-Darwinist nature made by humans. It is an utopos also in the sense that it is not confined to specific places, but can be exercised everywhere. 
In other words, we have a decentralized utopia already, and that on global scale. Is this the kind of utopia we wanted? Again, it is about utopia and the human condition. Here, the basic assumptions are that humans, first, strictly follow their self-interests. Second, maximize their personal, that is, strictly individual welfare. And third, that this will lead, like the invisible hand of Adam Smith, one theoretical founder of such a utopia, that this will lead to the benefit of all via self-organizing forces. As in modern concepts of natural control and in other concepts of system theory as the technological expression of a certain mythology of liberation uh, related on the maximizing wealth of the individual. We know that it did not happen that way. Point three, this uh, benefit for all, is not realized. And hence, the other two assumptions such a benefit is to settle upon, namely the primate of self-interest and of maximizing individual welfare, have to be doubted, of course. According to the Greek origins of decentralization and democracy in our cultural sphere, in the Greek polis, humans are not confined to be individualistic, but they are also communal animals. Reflected in the famous sentence of Aristotle that the human being is a communal animal, a zoon politikon, an animal living in the polis together with others. When we translate this basic assumption about the human condition into recent social, cultural, and socio economic contexts, the head topic of the conference, decentralization and the city, gains a deeper perspective. How to rethink the concept of a decentralized utopia when assuming that humans are both individualistic and communal beings at the same time? And how to improve such a condition in concrete city life, that is, in everyday life, in the face of a utopian capitalism with right inequalities and us being confronted with increasing centralized controls, even if there are indirect and deliberate taken controls. For instance, what has been presented before us on selfies. Okay. All right. So centralization, right, and decentralization. Centralization, it limits the individual's control over one's circumstances. But individuality in the Western worldview is often the norm, but at the very least it's expected. You strive to reach your own goals by yourself. But what is the limits of individuality and freedom? Is this actually something that's feasible or just an ideal to strive for? Who is a strong individual? Well, one who can carry out their own desires, but is that not something given to everyone? Is that not something everybody can do? Do we have all the same powers? Frankly, and sadly, probably not. Some individuals have more power than others due to the various systems that are in place, social, economic, politic, etc. To reach back to Bauman, only powerful individuals can actually experience this power. For everyone else, individuality is a systematically maintained illusion to keep the many weak separately. Lots of people with little power conditioned to do everything by themselves just make sure that no real agent or energy for change will emerge. By making each man to think that they are responsible by themselves for their own, the strength in numbers is drastically weakened. It is not accidental that billionaires have traditionally been against the unionization of workers, for example. One person by themselves does not necessarily have power, but a hundred people striving for the same goal can definitely make a dent. So community and solidarity is something that requires negotiation and ep empathy and understanding to be able to stand together for a common cause. Together, people are stronger, but reaching that togetherness in community is especially difficult today when everyone is conditioned to go for their own individual goals. Uh, so I have a quote from Joshua Taubera and from his article, So You Want to Reform Democracy. He says, it's not a technological problem. It's not something a slick website solves. 
building power is a social, societal, and institutional challenge. And if we're thinking about utopias or dystopias, the concept of power is always embedded in them. Who has the power to decide what and how? Who gets to who wins and who loses? And of course, utopias think that everybody wins, but is that something that's actually really possible? So in the end, just how centralized or decentralized are we today? Is it the contradiction that conventional belief that it's modernity and post, in particular postmodernity that with internet possibilities that liberated man, we are definitely much more connected than before, but at the same time, this, does this interconnectedness mean that we are less prone to doing things? Are there more people living as slaves today than before? Job dependencies, uh, millions of workers in other countries building your iPhones. Uh, how does that link together with the systems of power? So what is the relationship between decentralization and individual freedom in the face of such situations? Is that just an utopian hope or nothing more? Yeah, that's it. No, Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, so um, we're very happy to have some questions. I think we're still in time. Uh, if anybody wants to ask us about ideas and concepts. Wonderful. Thanks so much, you both. Um, so we have one question in the chat. Um, and folks on the live stream, if you have any others, now is the time to post them. Um, so this is from Brian. Uh, in your research, did you come across utopia proposals around energy technology um, proposals and principles? Etzler's energy harvesting based off the 19th century, for example? Um, I'll let you take this one, Uri. I did not come across, or to be more precise, I did not search specifically for utopias using energy principles. Um, what we were interested, we, what we are also interested in, perhaps someone in the audience also has something to say about this is, um, our research is looking at utopias from a very westernized worldview. So um, in that sense, we do have a lot of limitations of what a utopia is. And uh, if somebody has experience or links to his research that looks at utopias or the ideas of utopias from different cultures would also be interesting. I think the main point with regard to technology uh, and the issue of utopia and decentralization, this is very interesting. So we are in Venice here, no? and this is an unforeseen, an unforeseen uh, historical point, uh, ringing bell from the church. No? Now it's finished. Okay, uh, as regards the question of technique, utopias are about certain techniques of management, if we understand management also as a technique. but. The point Emerge addressed, this of uh, uh, power and of at least latent inequalities, also in utopian concepts, is not a matter of technique. So I can be uh, technically perfected, I can be ecologically correct, and so on and so on. It does not solve the power question. And uh, in a special way, as regards the recent application of technique, in a so-called internet age, uh, uh, since the 90s on, on broad scale, no? uh, we can introduce inequalities, very, very subliminal inequalities with the help of technique. Who has access to which kind of information, for instance? Who is able to surf uh, which devices to which extent, and so on? No? Uh, here, the question of technique and utopia is in, becomes a very, very uh, tricky and intrinsic one. When techniques, see for instance the recent China, uh, Chinese case, uh, when uh, techniques overtly help to suppress people. And in our case, uh, in a consumer society, when they indirectly help to suppress people by keeping them stupid consumers. To answer this question upfront and preliminary. Hmm? Uh, thank you both. Um, 
We have uh, another question. Um, which what? Is, oh, we have a, 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 a dog in the audience weighing in. Okay. Hello, dog. <laughs> um, Hello. This is, uh, do you have any recommendations for literature that depicts the decentralized utopias uh, that you discussed? Uh, yes, so we would be, I want to pose a proposal. Uh, what we would be interested, since you addressed it as the First Nations people, uh, what could be very, very interesting when we are discussing about decentralization, about utopias, is what, uh, what other cultures, even remnants of other cultures, are thinking about these concepts when we are speaking about decentralization. I think this could be a very fruitful approach. The second road can be what can we do in our in our daily living circumstances in Western societies? What can we do uh, in the direction of decentralization for really gaining more freedom means more freedom uh, in a uh, creative way that we can get more expressive, that we can get more alert as regards our immediate human environment, that we will get. Uh, more creative as regards the community work with our neighborhoods and so on so that to make things to the concrete utopia uh, that has been mentioned in the in the presentation as so these are two two strains of interest uh, um, as amongst others of course uh, what other cultures are thinking about the very utopian concept and what can we do in our daily living circumstances to come to a positive way of decentralization instead of living alone as uh, more or less isolated modernist individuals which also is a form of decentralization of course but not a, a human one uh, i'm also just um Ulrich, i also think um sarah please correct me but i think the the person who asked the question is asking for literature recommendations if i understood correctly I understood yeah, I think that was, uh, okay. Uh, if, you, if you have any, they would. That's what they would love. Yeah, to we make. can we can provide you uh, as if you want. We can provide you a list. But I deliberately wanted to pose these two roads because uh, we asked for several times for these First Nation uh, people, uh, and, and uh, as we would be really keen to hear more about it. <laughs> <laughs> and you will get a list, of course, as regards yeah. decentralization. Um, yeah. So okay. I mean. I guess, Sarah, perhaps, I don't know, we can send it via email to you because I think right now it's probably an extensive list. I know in Uli, he has a lot of articles and book recommendations. Of course, of course. I'm not sure if any either of you are in the conference chat channel as no, well. No, we're, but... we're not right now, I think. So uh, it's, uh, but um, I, I will figure out a way or I think. It, yeah, it, no, if you, if you email to me, I can, I can repost. Um, okay. I can repost in there as well. Um, yeah, thank you both so much. Okay, thank you so no, much. No further questions? Thank uh, you. So no, people are discussing they're discussing your answers in the chat, but I haven't seen any other questions come through. Okay. So, okay. so we'll right. wrap up. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, you too, and enjoy the rest of the conference.